Um, welcome to the first lecture in this new academic year at the A. Alfred Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, a an academic unit here at the great University of Michigan that uh, got that name during the tenure, the, the dean leadership of our featured speaker tonight, Professor and Dean Emeritus Doug Kelbaugh. I'm Jonathan Massey. I have the privilege of following in Doug's footsteps, as well as those of Monica Ponce de Leon and others who have led the college. And I am glad to welcome you and introduce our speaker this evening um, for a talk entitled 55 Years of Design and Planning, a chance for Doug in this, the semester of his retirement uh, from University of Michigan to share some of the insights from his career. I think a few weeks ago, he suggested to me that this, you know, he thought of this as a chance first of all, to tie together pieces of his work that uh, many of you will know uh, parts of, but but may not see the whole picture that they constitute. And also thinking that the, the arc of any um, high impact career like this one might be helpful to know about for each of us at our different personal and career stages as we think about how the different pieces of our own individual activity add up, how one thing might lead to a surprising follow-up, and what our, you know, and, and and certainly thinking about this lecture has has put me in mind quite urgently of the question of what will my legacy be after 55 years of career? And boy, is it daunting to follow in this guy's footsteps. Let me tell you just a little bit about him, and then he will tell us uh, even more about him in, in what we can dream might be a one-minute-per-year presentation. Um, so uh, so Doug Kelbaugh has uh, – well, let me, let me just use this slide um, – one of the glories of being a highly accomplished, prominent member of the fields of architecture, urban planning, and urban design is that there are many bios of Doug Kelba out there uh, in the world. And I chose this one because I feel like it it really captures in a in a beautiful summary some of the key points. Uh, Doug studied architecture at Princeton uh, and uh, launched his career as a practitioner in the Princeton area. And I will say, just to illustrate, that I, I have been living in Doug's shadow since I first started studying architecture at Princeton uh, in, in a later era. One of the buildings I passed all the time, you will see in the exhibition next door in, in uh, East Windsor, New Jersey, um, became a case study in courses on postmodernism and high tech. And I think Charles Jinks might even have included it in one of his many compendia. So uh, my instructors were showing me that building and this solar house with a trom wall that you'll also see in the exhibition next door. Um, then, uh, Doug moved into education. He chaired the architecture program at the University of Washington, where he developed uh, a pedagogical practice that I think has shaped the educational trajectory of most of us in this room. It was the design charrette as a way to bring, uh, professional and academic expertise into dialogue with community knowledge and place-based knowledge. Um, to generate proposals, visions, and strategies for neighborhood and urban development and transformation. So if you've ever participated in a design charrette around a community development project, or if you've done a three-day intensive design sprint uh, that was aimed at eliciting community insight about a building site or about a neighborhood, and then brought your own design and planning expertise to bear on that problem, you have been practicing a pedagogy that Doug really helped establish as a central feature of late 20th and early 21st century uh, urban engagement. He came to the University of Michigan. I, I sent an email out yesterday with, with the wrong number of years, but he came in 1998, if I remember correctly, uh, to, to lead the college as dean. One of the things that he had accomplished at University of Washington in work with Peter Calthorpe and many others was to establish the movement for the new urbanism, codified in uh, a couple of years uh, but, but maybe six years before he came here, codified in the formation of the Congress for the New Urbanism, a group that many of you know about and perhaps have participated in. But uh, this 
this period at Washington was quite powerful in terms of building a new discourse around American cities, arguing for new urbanist principles. I won't go into what those are because I think you're all very knowledgeable about that and we'll probably see some of that work from Doug. Certainly some of it's in the exhibition next door. Um, but he really helped create a movement that materially transformed the American landscape. One of the things I have always admired about Doug is that through that an initial little sally, the pedestrian pocketbook that came out of one of those charrettes, he started to establish principles that made their way into into legislation. And, and the Congress for the New Urbanism stands out for me as an example of the impact that design ideas and planning principles can have when they are linked up to larger publics who, who write city codes and who establish legislation. Um, and so the impact of this initially pretty tight group of, um, of innovators has really been immeasurable. Um, Doug led the college here for a decade as dean, um, including the the moment when Al Taubman gave his transformational uh, gift, establishing the naming gift for the college and establishing the endowment that continues to fund um, scholarships and faculty research support funds and um, and supports some of the strength of the college built up. Uh, you know, under Doug's leadership in a way that included creating the Master of Urban Design degree that is is uh, one of our key graduate programs today. Um, Doug has also been recognized uh, in a number of forums, and I'm just going to, to kind of um, sum up some of what distinguishes that career with two quotes um, from his awarding a few years ago uh, in, for, of the the 2016 Topaz Medallion, the highest award for uh, excellence in architectural education, granted by the American Institute of Architects and the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture annually. The roster of this award is an incredible group, and Doug uh, is right there in near the top of it. Um, and, and the award text acknowledged Doug for being the quintessential teaching architect um, who has linked teaching, practice, and writing to shape a generation's thinking about the environmental aspects of architecture, starting with energy, solar energy, climate concerns at the building scale, addressing those through helping to invent the concept of transit-oriented development as part of that CNU gang, um, where we think about energy at the urban and regional scale in things like transit um, and walkability and um, urban heat islands, which you can learn about in the book that Doug will be signing next door afterward at the reception for his exhibition, The Urban Fix, Resilient Cities in the War Against Climate Change, Heat Islands, and Overpopulation. So the last quote I will include is that of, of Michael Sorkin, who upon awarding of the Topaz Medallion, characterized Doug as a model architect and a model citizen, characterized ultimately by this profound dedication to bettering life on the planet for its inhabitants. Is there any greater calling for an architect, planner, and urban designer? So um, as, a, as a concluding part of this overlong introduction, before I hand the mic over to uh, our esteemed colleague, Doug Kelbaugh, I would just like to announce um, the creation of the Kelbaugh Scholarship Fund and to thank Doug and his wife, Kathleen Nolan, for establishing this new fund with a gift of $100,000 to support students in our Master of Urban Design degree. So please join me in thanking Doug. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Testing. Well, I don't have to say anything now. That pretty well covered it. I'd rather you do this. Is that possible? Thanks. And let's get this image up here. Whoops, that's not the first image. Yeah, here we go. Testing. Oh, well, it's obvious that uh, the faculty and staff care about this. I wish there were a few students here. 
Uh, I'm willing to send up somebody with cash to bring a few down. If they... <laughs> anyway, so I'm starting out by dedicating this lecture to Mary Ann Drew. How many remember Mary Ann Drew? Uh, I mean, I don't know. We have a much, much bigger staff now. She, when she was single-handedly running this place, we hardly needed staff. Uh, and boy, did she help raise, uh, help me raise $45 million. She had a personal touch with so many alums, it's hard to name them all. I mean, even list them. It's, she was something special. Uh, most of my professional work is archived at the CCA in Montreal, but I have saved some stuff. Uh, including some key stuff, which are hung next door in the gallery, which I hope you get a chance to see. So here I am. I started the clock 55 years ago when I took my first design course with Peter Eisenman, of all people, sophomore year. Uh, and that was 55 years ago. And back then, Korb was God, Shandigar was Mecca, Eisenman, Graves, Guathi, Frampton, Bidler, these were all my teachers. I actually took a year off from college Worked my way around the world as an, and uh, sketched a lot of places. I think this sketch is next door. Everywhere from Chandigarh uh, to the Acropolis to London. It was an amazing year. Selling encyclopedias door to door in uh, Australia. That's how I made enough money to keep going. Uh, and having an American accent helped. So here's a, a sketch I did uh, like this one uh, on the Acropolis. What's wrong with this sketch? Come on, you guys are architects. What's wrong with this sketch? Something really basic. Yeah, it's missing two columns. And all I can think of is I got so invested in the drawing, I didn't want to give it up. And I just finished it knowing it was wrong. So I don't know, it looks all right, except it's dead wrong. Um, my master's thesis, I have some of that next door. I actually got to build it first in Princeton, and then I took it up to New Hampshire and built it on a hillside where we didn't <laughs> dig the pilings deep enough, and uh, it got got spit literally spit out of the earth. Uh, in northern New Hampshire, it gets pretty cold. But it's a kit of parts, self-help housing. It was meant to compete with... Uh, mobile homes, which were desecrating the countryside, in my opinion, then. So then, while working for the city of Trenton, uh, I was able to buy a small lot in Princeton and uh, build this house, which was a huge gamble. No one had ever, there had only been a couple of Tromwald sort of test cells built in uh, Odeo in the, in the Pyrenees certainly not a two-story one. And so it was a huge gamble to build this. And fortunately, I have to credit my first wife, who had a little bit of money that allowed us to do this. It cost $55,000 to build. It shows you how much construction costs have gone up. And uh, here's the inside of it. You can see the inside of the concrete wall. It's not painted black like the outside, which is a special black paint. Anyway, I'm not going to go through a trauma wall. But it worked. And it was in a hundred books and magazines from Newsweek on, on up and down the line. And I didn't know it, but it sort of launched my career as a passive solar architect. That, that, that was an unintended but um, welcome consequence. Um, so there we are. Is that my family there? I think we had one kid, yeah, uh, in the, in the, at that point. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, many of you might know the name Harrison Fraker. He was an architect, a competing architect. He later became dean at Berkeley. Here we are doing an early solar workshop back in the mid-70s, late 70s, where I, while I was also teaching, because frankly, I couldn't make enough money as an architect. I had to teach. I, I taught at Penn in the fall and NGIT in Newark uh, in, in, the I guess, what was called the spring term then, uh, just to make ends meet. Um, certainly these workshops didn't do much. And then I was lucky enough in the late 70s to have a two-month fellowship at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen and able to do lectures in Norway and Sweden. Now, they were already 
building dense walkable new towns with rooftop solar collectors in the, in the uh, late 70s. They were way ahead of us. They still are way ahead of us. We have a lot to learn from the Europeans. Here's the firm in 1975 to 80. It wasn't very big. Kilbo and Lee, that's Song Lee on the right, a Korean um, architect who studied at Penn, and I guess, I guess I met him down there, and uh, some other employees, and then that morphed a bit into a different group of employees, but Song Lee is still there on the right. Uh, look at me in a tie. It's really, it's a different world. Um, and then next door, you'll, this environment, this is first silkscreen I ever did, and that was as a grad student just messing around in the top floor of, of the architecture school. But it got on the Princeton Alumni Weekly cover, which was a total shocker because that's a widely read magazine. And there's my master's thesis on the right uh, before it got spit out of the earth by uh, frozen ground. And there's the solar house, and I'm not sure why I'm showing this slide. Uh, and then this is Solar Environmental Center, the biggest project we did, which also had trom walls and direct gain and greenhouses, other passive techniques that were working well. A small group of passive solar pioneers were happily producing energy-efficient houses until it hit us that we were really part of a bigger problem, sprawl. We were doing a lot of suburban houses. Uh, so we shifted from single-family dwellings to multifamily dwellings, as this little sketch shows, uh, and to larger buildings. Um, these two drawings have colored my work for 40 years, realizing that, you know, a passive, even if it's passive solar, extremely efficient suburban house is part of the problem, not the solution because of all the auto-dependency that goes along with it. God, I think I've already... All right, these are just some projects at different times. A Civic Center competition, a big one in Monroeville. We won. They never built it. And then this housing project on the right did win a National Honor Award a long time ago. And uh, we won. The, now we won third prize in that other that lower left competition. It was neither of those were built. Here's a drawing on the right done by a German who worked for me. That drawing to show you how different things were. That drawing took two weeks. Two weeks to do that drawing. Um, now, you know, with computers. Uh, now, this is that house out in uh, West Windsor or whatever, east of Princeton. N not the house, the building that I think you're talking about. And uh, we did it with Richard Rogers, uh, who, you know, every firm in Princeton, which had more architects per capita, by the way, than any equivalent, you know, per capita, more architects than any place in the country. And all the big firms went after him. And he, he came to our solar house and he said, you know, I think I'm going to work with you. Uh, he didn't want a big, you know, um, hungry firm. We were small and hungry. but um, So that was a thrill to build that. that. That's since been expanded a bit. That's the whole idea of this building is that you can keep expanding it in a linear fashion. So um, that helped get us on the national map. And then this little pedestrian pocketbook, the charrette in UW spawned what later was called TOD, Transit Oriented Development. This little book was a number one national bestseller uh, in design, which is a very limited uh, cohort of books. Uh, but later the name changed from pedestrian pocket to um, TOD. And then I moved to Washington. And this was right after I moved to the University of Washington in 1985. Didn't I had an office, but I was chair, and it was very hard to do. I, I so I ended up not designing a lot. But this is one really cool project. It's a highway highway rest stop with composting toilets, way up in the mountains, uh, which had two buildings. Unfortunately, we only built this one, the toilet building. Um, and it's all composting toilets. It's hard to do in that climate because it's very cold. This is a pass, I don't know, 6,000 feet high or something like that. Um, so between here and UW, uh, I've done about 10, 20 design shreds. I've actually been in some other ones, but I've organized 20. And uh, 
here are some stats for the 12 done in Detroit. 30 faculty from schools within UM and other local universities participated, 80 local design professionals and consultants, 60 well-known visiting professionals and academics from the US and other countries, and over 600 students, including occasionally some folks from high school. The reason I developed charrettes was a financial need. I wanted to bring a lot of well-known architects to the University of Washington, and it was not a very well-funded university or program, and I couldn't afford to do it. So I thought I can bring them for a week, and they're more likely to come if they're all there at the same time, and we'll do a charrette. And it, it came out of a budgetary need. Um, it was just solving a, you know, a logistical problem for me. But they did catch on, and here's some of the ones we did in Detroit downtown. We've done some outside of downtown Detroit. There we are working in the upper right at the Detroit DTE headquarters, which some of you, like Roy, was involved in. And uh, who else? Anybody else involved in a charrette here? Most of them are probably, yeah, Craig Borum, Robert Fishman, uh, Kit, Melissa. So there's some hangers on. Great. Uh, I'm a hanger on, but not for long. Um, so I think they had an impact on Detroit. Maurice Cox, who unfortunately we're losing to Chicago, was in some of the charrettes, and he definitely, uh, I think, deployed or included some of the ideas that came out of them. Uh, here's the one booklet. I think it's next door. The uh, riverfront. This would be the uh, eastern riverfront. Um, and I always was looking for an excuse to do watercolors. I love to do watercolors. So I was able to do this in the heat um, and uh, intensity of a charrette. Um, we forget, guys, that this university started in Detroit, in this building, when Detroit only had 1,500 residents. In 1837, it moved out here, and there were only 2,000 residents. We, we really are part of Detroit. I think we owe a lot to Detroit. I'm happy that Jonathan is embracing Detroit. There's a lot of work to be done there. There's the Detroit Center, which uh, I took the lead on founding. How many of you have ever been to the Detroit Center downtown? Yeah, it's still going. We had a full-blown studio just for this college initially, but uh, I, it's sort of given way to some other stuff at another building that I think Craig Wilkins is doing. Craig couldn't be here tonight. Jonathan Levine slinks in. Um, a good chair of urban planning. Glad to see some planners. So about that time, Al Talm, actually, in my beginning of my second year, he gave us this gift of $30 million. That was the biggest gift at the time ever given to a school of architecture or planning. And he uh, later gave us another $15 million or so. Uh, by far the most ever given to a school of architecture and urban planning. He's a great guy. Uh, some of you had the pleasure of meeting. Um, his children are take you know are still major philanthropists, and um, we may see more gifts. We one of those gifts came under Monica Ponce de Leon, which was set up beforehand actually. After deaning for a decade, I had two years in Dubai and was working on projects like this one in the foreground. You know, just a small project, a new city for 1.8 million people. I mean, they were intoxicated, uh, truly. Uh, I don't have a pointer. Do I have a pointer? Yeah, that's, a, that's the world's largest, busiest airport. Well, it's debatable, but it's, it's ranked one or two or three. Huge. These are some of those, you know, islands and fronds, they're called, that were built somewhere. But this was our project. And I'm happy with Peter Calthorpe, and I'm happy to say we killed it. It was absurd. First of all, that's a canal. It's a very long, expensive canal that goes nowhere. It goes into the desert and back out. It was a big project. We're talking about a lot of people, a lot of construction, and all the right stuff, all the right systems, renewability, and 
sustainability and all that, but it was in the wrong place. So I was happy when it died. Um, there's still where I was in Dubai not that long ago. There's more sane stuff going on than that project, including this one. This is on an existing rail line now in Dubai. This is the last stop. And that's where our company owned this land, or actually it was all owned by the ruler, but leased to our company, Limitless. And we built a bunch of stuff here. We built this building. We built these buildings. This was, what's that firm from Pittsburgh? Kit, did you? What's that? Pittsburgh kit. Who is that firm? I am paid did some of these. I forget who did that. This is a Pittsburgh firm. No, not Bowen Sawinski. Anyway, it doesn't matter. And I, we went to some of the best Muslim architects in the world to design this mosque. And we just didn't like what they were doing. And I said one day to our leader, Sheikh Saeed, a little guy about, about that high, was ran our company. We had 550 people there at that time. He was the world chess champ as a teenager, amazing guy. He was running this company, uh, maybe into the ground, but he was definitely running it. And uh, then when the recession came, it hurts. But so I, I said at one point, we don't like these architects. Would you let me take a chance, even though I'm a Christian, uh, at designing a mosque? And he said, yeah. So this, this is what I designed. What's going on here? Uh, there are pictures of it next door. It's unusual in a lot of ways. The prayer hall is glass, which is the opposite of every other one. They're all about privacy, but there are these smasherbia, they're called, these screens that slide back and forth. Oh, God, is this on a timer now? Um, that slide back and forth to provide privacy. And then there's the minaret. There's a lot, a lot of stuff I could explain, but it's too small an image. You do see a little, a little half moon at the top of the minaret and an eroded face facing Mecca. Um, that's a hole that lets light through. And if you stay in a certain spot, you can see the sky through it. And that's it. That's the only symbolism on the entire building. There's no writing, everything else. And, and all these, these guys are meant to be foliage because after all, we evolved on the edge of the forest, edge of the savanna in uh, Africa and all human beings are hardwired to love dappled light. It's just in our hardwiring, in our genetic code. So I was trying to capture that the roof floats above like a quote-unquote magic carpet and had solar collectors and so on and so forth. It may get built. The full set of documents are in there. It's the most complete set of architectural documents you will ever see in your life. It's about 100 pages uh, of just detail after detail. after. It's very carefully designed. And uh, Saeed thinks it may get built. We'll see. Be nice. Certainly the most intense project other than this book that I've ever worked on. I see some other books there. Um, okay. Two years almost in Dubai, came back here to teach and to write and did studios. Here's a Detroit TOD. You can see a couple Albert Kahn masterpieces in the background, you know, the Fisher Building. These were compact, dense, walkable, multimodal around the train station. Maurice Cox wanted to pull this off. We'll see if they do a new Amtrak and actually have a TOD there. It's right on Woodward. It's a great location. It could be a wonderful project. Uh, I did, was able to write. Uh, pedestrian pocketbook was in UW, but and Commonplace was written out there. But I wrote Repairing the American Metropolis here and Writing Urbanism with Kit McCullough as co-editor. And then there are the little books, The Michigan Debates on Urbanism. Most of you, anybody remember The Michigan Debates on Urbanism? Yeah, they were pretty amazing. It was like Peter Eisenman versus some of his former students, Cal Thorpe and Lars Larup and 
uh, I can't remember all of them, Rahul Marotra and people like that. So we did three little books, which I think you can still buy. I think they still have them. And then most recently, The Urban Fix, which is the most intense single project of my life, five years of research and two years to write. Uh, with the lucky uh, t six months spent in um, in Cambridge. You know, my wife went home. Oh, good. Hi. And there's Doug Graff. Came all the way from Ohio State in Columbus. Let's give Doug Graff a round of applause. <laughs> Doug and I, he was the smartest guy in our architecture class. Then we were Vista volunteers, which in what was then politically correct to call the ghetto of Trenton, where we worked there, and uh, and then uh, he taught here for a term, and he taught out of UW, and uh, he has a photographic memory. Ask him, name any city, and he'll draw you a map of it. It's uncanny. So thank you, Doug, for coming. So speak out. I've written a lot of editorials. This one was in Planning Magazine, and I don't remember what it was about. Uh, can you, what's that say? Oh, you can read it better than I am. Oh, it's about affirmative action here at U of M and how justice is intergenerational and, and how the Supreme Court, I can't quite read that up there. Anyway, uh, it was a thrill to get it in a magazine like Planning. It's also important to keep up with your alma mater. I was able to be Tiger of the Week <laughs> in, uh, with a little article in the Alumni Weekly, which is now bi-weekly. Can you imagine an alumni magazine that came out every week for many years, a weekly? Um, Princeton is over the top, as we know, Jonathan and I. It's absurdly, uh, what's the word, chauvinistic. Okay, I mean chauvinistic in the grandest sense, not just gender. It is all about itself. It's, it's in love with itself. So bridging a theme. Uh, I'd like to think of my career bridging academically, professionally, and personally. So here are some ideas that might help. Cultivate early commissions for members of your extended family and your friends. <laughs> That's the way most architects get started. It's the way I got started. Have a mentor, however informal, and it typically is informal. Enter design competitions, especially regional ones, but only if you fully intend to win. There's no sense in entering unless you're going full bore, 125%. You can get students, as I did from Penn and other places, to help. And then if we won, you know, we got some prize money. We never got a commission. But that would be shared with the help we got. Treat your colleagues and employees with great respect. That goes without saying. At the end of your career, recommend and promote younger colleagues. Be a mentor, again, informally. And give your drawings to an archive, if possible. And I'm happy to say that the Bentley is coming over to go through this show. And hopefully they'll take some of it, because otherwise it's going in the trash bin. Um, well, we do have a flat file. I might save a few of those mylars. Uh, we'll see. So hard work actually does pay off sometimes. Um, FAIA on the left. Frankly, FAIA, as Craig and others know, it's sort of something you got to get done. Just get it over with. It's not like... It's something you want behind you. It's not something you aspire to be. It's, uh, but if you don't have it, it's a bit of a price to pay in the profession. So it's sort of a weird. The towpath was an honest to God thrill. I have to tell you, it took me more multiple attempts to get it. Um, and then on the right, a medal I'm really thrilled about. Um, that's from the North Campus Criterium bike race. Right. Um, who was it? Anybody in that race? Where's Glenn? Where the heck is? Where's it? What's that? Yeah, we do. Uh, 
Because guess what? If you go across the street and walk in on the left as you enter the, what's it called? Pierpont. You'll see the North Campus winners. And if you go down there to faculty staff teams, we won, we won second place. Who was on our team? Glenn and Keith and, and me and, um, but if you'll notice, there's no third place. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were other teams, but I don't know, for some reason they didn't award it. There were a lot. Anyway, I was hoping that Glenn or Keith would revive this because, because I still have a whole bunch of those beautiful medals. Uh, a whole box of them. They were cast downstairs by the art technicians. Really great. Uh, so there are a lot of blank things there. It could be a lot of these bike races. It, it's a perfect place. There's a loop of two and a half miles and you can do different number of laps. It's um, So we're in the meantime... In my undergrad course, I have over 200 students who calculate their carbon footprint. They just did it last week. And then during the course of the term, they try to improve it. And usually the lowest hanging fruit for them is less meat, less red meat, more using the bus more or biking more. They really do it. So you can calculate your footprint in about three minutes at myfootprint.com. You will be humbled. You will be humbled. Americans have the biggest footprints on the planet. I mean, they're Qatar as a higher one, but um, from the average American footprint is about four point five Earths. So, if everybody lived like Americans on the planet, it would, we'd need four and a half Earths. This is really damning stuff. Really damning. Um, now, we have solar collectors on our roof. We have one car. We walk and bike a lot. I biked here t today. It still would take about three Earths. Last year, we got down to 2.5 because we didn't go to Europe. And I'm not giving up Europe, I'll tell you that. Um, so if everyone lived like me, um, it would be about three Earths, Cat and I, roughly three Earths. Uh, we all need to do a lot better. That's a lot of, I mean... We're, we, live, we have unsustainable lifestyles. So in 2003, while I was dean, I challenged everyone in the college to calculate their ego footprint, offering to make a contribution for all those who had a smaller footprint. 234 responded, including alums. 216 beat me. 17 beat me badly, and one killed me. And it cost me $1,350. It was a a student from India, I think. And that student is the only human being I ever met who worked her lifestyle back and calculated for when she was a child in India and she got back to one earth. That's the only human being that I've ever met that, had, that if everybody lived like, you know, we'd manage on, with one earth. Um, Emissions would need to decrease by 35 to 50% from 2005 to 2030 to achieve the two degrees Celsius or centigrade goal of the UN. Our bottom-up research has confirmed that such an improvement is possible but very challenging on a 2030 time horizon. And with current political leadership, forget it. Think about that in your next vote. Um, it's a really heavy lift. The next generations have the, uh, none of whom are here. Any students? <laughs> um, the next generations have the unavoidable responsibility to move millions of Americans and others from low-lying and hot cities and towns to higher and cooler existing and new receiver communities. Detroit, I suspect, will be a big receiver city. Um, while dealing with food and resource shortages, farming is in for a really tough ride. Epidemics, social unrest, civil violence, and international warfare. I mean, heat's not going to do it. It's all the civil unrest that comes along 
with the disruption, with the, you know, food shortages, et cetera. Uh, as I say to my kids, it'll be a, a dangerous, wild ride, uh, but one that may have more personal meaning than today's less dramatic challenges. I think there are silver linings. People will have some meaningful experiences dealing with this. I think our kids are going to have a wild ride, that is these students, and our grandkids are going to have a horrible ride, I hate to say, and we have a couple of grandkids. I just can't picture what they're going to go through. The road to sustainability runs through the world's towns and cities. By building sustainable towns and cities, you will build global sustainability. As Ban Ki-moon said when he was Secretary General of the UN, the country is the sum of cities. If cities do not work, then countries cannot work. Cities are important. What can they do? How can they help? Well, they're much more innovative per acre, per capita, any way you want to mention it. Uh, far more patents, far more, you name it. Um, they are just plain smarter, and they make people who live in them smarter. Um, and it's all about interaction, of course. Um, they also produce a lot of wealth. 90% of our GDP and 86% of our jobs are generated in our metropolitan areas. That includes the whole metro area of our major, of our major cities. It's a lot of wealth produced. But, 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 cities consume most of the world's energy and produce most of the carbon dioxide. And they are projected to get worse. How can cities help, which is the whole point of this book? Well, one is the because of the environmental paradox of cities, a term that I think describes uh, this phenomenon. This very important chart done by some new urbanists in Chicago. And by the way, I never liked the architecture in new urbanism. <laughs> I was always embarrassed by it. It's the urbanism that's good, not the architecture. It was pretty cloying in many cases. Anyway, the map on the left shows the traditional view of the city. The redder it is, the more CO2 that's being produced. And obviously down around the loop in the center, it's the most intensive. And then as it moves out to the inner suburbs and the outer suburbs and the countryside, there's less CO2 produced. That's per acre. The map on the right, which no one had ever done, is per capita. And it turns out the greenest part of Chicago is right downtown. Footprints are smaller. Why? People drive less, they walk more, they take transit more, they live in smaller units that share, wa share walls, ceilings, and floors with other units, so heating and cooling them is cheaper. Um, and their transportation costs are much less, as I said, because of transit, biking, and walking. So guess what? The greenest part of Chicago is the densest part of Chicago. Greenest in the true sense of the word green, producing the least amount of methane, the least amount of greenhouse gases and CO2. How many people knew about this paradox? Yeah, not a lot. It's a biggie. Uh, so the environmental paradox defined, when people cluster in dense mixed use cities rather than sprawl, they have a big ecological footprint, but their ecological footprint per capita is smaller than in low density development. That's right, Jonathan has done a lot of work on this and Joe Grang's too probably. Cities are greener than they look. All that economic investment in buildings and infrastructure is a good eco energy carbon investment. Look at this chart. Shocking. The paradox is more dramatic. That chart of Chicago was only transportation. If you include heating and cooling and lighting and the energy embodied in the building materials to build, remember, it takes less materials to build multifamily housing than single family dwellings. Look at the difference. Red is transportation between a low density and a high density area. Is that dramatic or what? the reduction in the high density here. Purple is building operations. That's heating and cooling and lighting. Actually, lighting goes up a bit because there's less natural light. It doesn't go up in total, but heating and cooling does 
and brings it way down. And the last is materials. There are less materials used per capita in the city. And it's per capita we care about. It's not per acre. Well, we care about both. Suburban sprawl also has a lot of stormwater runoff with toxic fertilizer pollution of lakes and streams and so on. There are other problems with suburbia. The single biggest invention of America was sprawl, suburban sprawl, and we exported it all over the world. Now the rest of the world is finally realizing, wait a minute, we copied the wrong model. Let's look to Europe. Let's not look to the U.S. Frankly, that's happened in the last five, ten years. It certainly happened in Dubai. Because of this, a map like this, Atlanta and Barcelona. How many people have been to Barcelona? Yeah, not a bad city. Well, they're about the same population, as you can see. Whoops. Um, actually, Barcelona has a few more people. Look, the urban land area, look at the difference. This is a sprawling monster. Transport carbon emissions, 7.5 versus 0.7, 10 times greater here in Atlanta. This is huge differentials, which is why Europe is a much better model than America for the developing countries. But, 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 there's a problem. It's called the urban heat island. The urban heat island effect. Large cities tend to be warming at more than twice the rate of the planet and the suburbs surrounding it and the countryside. Global estimates of climate change are likely to underestimate rates of warming in the very places where most of the global population now resides, in cities. And we want more people living them, but they're getting hot. They're getting too hot. Here's the heat island in Atlanta in 1972 versus 1993, and you can imagine it's much worse now. Atlanta has lost half of its tree cover with all that suburbanization, Seattle a third. Oh, I'm sorry I don't have more up to date, but urban heat islands are deterring people from moving to cities or staying in cities, and that's where we want them to keep their eco footprint down, their carbon footprint down, their energy footprint down, you name their footprint. Ooh, I'm on a low battery here. We better hurry up. Well, there's the, there's the heat island effect. It's much hotter in the city, but we're very lucky. It turns out that strategies to mitigate and adapt to urban heons are consistent, identical, really, with strategies to deal with climate change. That's a really lucky break. Is there a way to plug this? Uh, is there a way to, I'm afraid I'm going to run out of battery. Is there, anybody know? What's that? Oh, boy. No, I don't. Anybody got a charger? Because I got some good stuff coming. Um, it's a Mac Pro. MacBook Pro. If anybody, oh, wonder, this is one of my GSIs. Fabulous. All right. Very, very lucky that dealing with urban heat islands directly deals with climate change. And here are the four ways you deal with climate change. Uh, in particular, I'm sorry, the way you deal with urban heat islands. Oh, I see. The first is albedo. Do you know what albedo is? That's the reflectivity, how bright colors are, white being high albedo. So we need lighter colored roofs, lighter colored pavements, and lighter colored walls. I should go in there now. Thank you very much. So albedo enhancement. And then there's sensible heat reduction. This is not the greenhouse gases that come out of tailpipes and chimneys and air conditioners. It's just plain the hot air that comes out. Just plain heat, hot air. That's called sensible heat. We need to reduce that. Remember, those air conditions are pumping it out like mad into the urban streets. And then we need to open up what are called street canyons or building canyons to ventilating winds. And then last, we need to create cool microclimates within the city, primarily through trees for shade, 
but they do a lot more than that, as you'll see in a second. Um, it's a long list. Trees are unbelievable multitaskers. So one color's big. We care about our melted ice cream cone, maybe more. Here's a guy who lost his shoes because the asphalt was so hot and sticky. So dark roofs, most of our roofs are dark. Most of our pavement is dark. It's a big problem. It's the road, stupid. Let's start depaving. This is where I bike over in Water Hill on my way out here on River Drive. Look at the size of the paving. Look at the width of that street. Even with parallel parking on both sides, which you see very little of, it could be a four-lane highway. They're all over America. They're all over Ann Arbor. Let's rip up the sides and put gravel in or narrow it. It's just unbelievable how much asphalt there is. When you leave tonight and you go out Bonestale and then turn right on to, take a look at the size of that intersection. It's an oceanic intersection of asphalt. This is a little tiny cross street on Water Hill. There's hardly any traffic. Look at all that asphalt. White paint is the simplest passive solar technology. It reflects four times as much as a dark roof. Four times. And where does that light go? It goes all the way into outer space to the end of the universe. It comes through our, through our um, atmosphere as very short, very fast wavelengths, hits a white surface or any light surface, and it goes back out as light. And it just goes through the, just, it came in as easily as it goes back out and goes forever, literally. So why, you know, increasing the albedo, uh, lighter colors are really important. This, this is some students actually from Princeton, some engineering students painting a white roof. They reduced the temperature by one degree in that neighborhood. Uh, with a 5%, and that usually means a 5% cut in mortality risk. Here's the white roof above our building in the armory downtown in Carytown. Uh, we put a white roof up there, and we have domestic hot water heaters for uh, hot water use, and PVs, photovoltaics for electricity. We have a negative energy bill for much of the year. We actually uh, then get credit in the winter when these aren't working as well. Um, but I think our average utility bill is $4.56 a month, something like that. Right, Kat? Yeah. Um, so white roofs, collectors, they all help. They help a lot. And it, this roof is pretty flat, so it's easy to install these. But, you know, even if you have asphalt shingles on a slope roof, you can buy Asphalt shingles now that have a clear coating, so they look just like they normally do, but they reflect most of the light back out. They're quite miraculous. They're worth the extra expense if you care about your kids and grandkids. Even if you don't have kids or grandkids. All right, the second one is less waste heat through more walkable trends or less auto-dependent cities. This is Portland, Oregon, a sort of poster child. Um, less AC, which pumps hot air into the streets. Every one of those ACs is pumping hot air. Uh, less tailpipe and chimney emissions. Uh, not just the greenhouse gases, but also just playing the hot air. They're both uh, disastrous. So this is Beijing, Roy, where Roy's and Robert and I have spent some time, maybe others. They have air pollution, which actually is a blessing because they want to get rid of the air pollution. And while doing that, they're going to be addressing the heat island and climate change simultaneously. They're actually, to get better ventilation through Beijing, they're actually going to tear down some tall buildings, some new buildings. They're going to tear them down because they need to get more air moving through the city, to, well, ostensibly to get rid of the pollution. But they also are smart enough to know it's dealing with heat islands and climate change. It's pretty extraordinary. Trees, I said, were amazing. This is just how amazing they are. They create these little cool microplanets. I mean, I'm going to bore you and just walk you through this. 
They're beautiful. They provide shade. They retain soil. They uh, retain stormwater. They sequester CO2. They produce oxygen. They filter particulate pollution. They cool the air by evapotransportation through their leaves. They provide bird animal habitat. They produce flowers, fruit, and fragrance. They offer tree climbing for children. They absorb sound. They reduce crime. It's shown they reduce crime. There are stats from Baltimore and elsewhere. Increase real estate values. They provide wood for construction, furniture, wood for fuel, planning, and maintenance jobs. Um, they humanize overscaled urban spaces. They soothe the psyche. And as we read, Kat and I, in Poland, they soak up nuclear blasts. I don't think so. I don't think trees can soak up a nuclear blast. Some real Stalinist propaganda. It was actually a Stalinist new town. It was pretty depressing. Trees, trees, trees. Look at these trees. These are pictures I've taken around from Ann Arbor to Saigon. Look, actually, I didn't take that lower tree in the right. That's a tree I just read about in South Carolina. Uh, here's a famous one in Oaxaca, Mexico. I mean, trees are miracles, in my opinion. So I'm going to sort of review why cities and urban design are important. One, climate change urgently needs to be addressed. And mixed-use walkable transit-served cities have lower carbon footprints per capita. The bigger and denser the city, the better. Oh, I didn't read two. Uh, no, I did read two. Three, urban living dampens birth rates. It lowers birth rates which decreases our total carbon footprint. This is really important. People who move to cities have fewer kids. Kids are more expensive to raise in the city. This is a particularly big deal in the developing world. In fact, let me just emphasize, they're moving to cities all over the developing world, let's take Asia, and their income goes way up and they have a bigger carbon footprint. But no, they don't because they have fewer kids dramatically fewer kids. In Africa, their birth rate might go from eight kids to four kids or three kids. It's a huge benefit to the planet and to them. So lowering birth rates, I mean, remember the planet, the amount of CO2 up there and the amount of greenhouse gases is a product of individual footprints per capita, you know, individual footprints times the number of people. So the number of people is a big deal. But as we've said, urban heat islands get hotter. They, de they deter people from moving to or staying in cities. The good news is that addressing urban heat islands simultaneously addresses climate change. And because urban heat islands are a more immediate and manageable problem, they can more quickly and urgently motivate people. That's what's good about urban heat islands. It's in your face. It's immediate and it's manageable. You can cool your city off. And in so doing, you're dealing with climate change. It's hard to motivate people to deal with climate change. It's an abstract, long-term problem. We're wired to deal with short-term, immediate problems. And last, voila, cities with all their vitality, their creativity and richness are, are, are cultivated and increased. And uh, I'm claiming in this book they may be our last best hope. I'm arguing in this book. They are our last best hope in the war against climate change. So building and rebuilding sustainable buildings and infrastructure, developing and redeveloping resilient cities with new neighborhoods and institutions like Detroit is doing, these challenges are monumental, urgent, and deeply meaningful for you to work on. My generation was compelled by some very compelling challenges. Your generation is, very, I'm talking to the younger faculty and all the students that are here, um, the younger generation is very compelled by very compelling, compelling challenges. I mean, the stakes have gone up. But here's the little miracle that shows we still have more than our share of good luck. At exactly the same time when it became clear that we have to stop burning fossil fuels, a wide variety of other technologies for generating energy became available. We're truly blessed. Great little book by Gwen Dyer. And remember, the young who aren't here, uh, they have the advantage in that they don't spend a lot of time unlearning things that are no longer worth knowing, which people my age have to do. So these are some thoughts. I, I had to clean out my office, and uh, I came across a few quotes that I thought were worth sharing. We're getting near the end, folks. In the final analysis, this is from 1988, the only things that, the only things that stay the same 
in architecture, the only thing that stays the same is physical place. Tides of culture and technology wash over a place, depositing architectural sediment that builds up in a very specific way. The environmental residues that build up are becoming more like images caught on photographic film, thin, flimsy, transparent. Without the physical home base, physical, we are ultimately lost in mass culture. Without a place to believe in and love, we start loving objects, consuming rather than truly investing in our home. A sense and love of place is the only antidote to the placelessness of industrial civilization. That's 1988. And I don't know who wrote it. I didn't. Um, and then this little one from 92, the rise, quote, in architectural values and virtues that might be loosely described as feminine, less emphasis on object buildings, on figural buildings, more emphasis on figural public space. You know, you know what I mean by figural public space? Less emphasis on egotistical invention, more on contextual convention. Multiculturalism needs action in architectural. Again, I, I thought it was a good quote. I have no idea who said it. I do know who wrote this because this came out two days ago in the New Yorker. It's not even uh, on the newsstand yet. Jonathan Franzen, a great, great writer, who wrote an article called What If We Stop Pretending? There is infinite hope, Franz Kafka tells us, only not for us. That was one of Kafka's famous lines. There's infinite hope, but it's not for us. But it seems to me, Franzen, in our rapidly darkening world, that the converse of Kafka's quip is equally true. There is no hope except for us. There is no hope except for us. Which leads me sort of into religion. Uh, and one of the great sayings, I don't know who said this either, leave behind more than you found. But this is an amazing church, synagogue, that share a space here in Ann Arbor. I think it's unique. Uh, and Buddhism, uh, a faith that I'm sort of trying to practice. It's not about magical faith in a god. There's no god in Buddhism. It's about living right, embracing compassion, seeking wisdom, avoiding attachment, avoiding hatred and ignorance. Education, what we're all involved in, is about as good as you can do. It's uh, Tibetan as opposed to Zen. They're both great traditions, but they just happen to be one of the world's greatest Tibetan Buddhists who live in our Ann Arbor until he died about a year and a half ago. Uh, I mean, he had followers all over the world. Amazing guy. But he's a teacher. There are no deities. There are no gods. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Vietnamese Buddhist monk, said, I can live happily in the present moment simply by remembering that I already have more than enough to be happy. I can help reduce the suffering of living beings on Earth and reverse the process of global warming. He's talking about global warming. This is a Buddhist monk. I am determined not to try to cover up loneliness, anxiety, or other suffering by losing myself in consumption, which I think Americans are wont to do. In essence, science and spirituality, though differing in their approaches, share the same end, which is the betterment of humanity. At its best, science is motivated by a quest for greater flourishing and happiness. In Buddhist language, this kind of science can be described as wisdom grounded and tempted by compassion. That's the Dalai Lama uh, writing there, uh, uh, an amazing guy who has been to Ann Arbor. So Buddhism a lot is about the balance, the middle way, cosmopolis, a great way to describe diversity, equity, and inclusion. Here's Kofi Annan and Mrs. Nane Wallenberg Annan visiting the niece of Raoul visiting our school. Does anybody remember that? Melissa does. Yeah, that was pretty big honor. And they're out there. That's a Raoul Wallenberg Memorial out there. They wanted to see that. Kofi has since died. She's still going strong. And the Wallenbergs, when I visited their foundation in Stockholm and said how much we appreciate what Raoul did, they said, what are you talking about? Of course he did it. Anybody. It's just expected. They didn't think it was a big deal at all. And now we have Raoul Wallenberg lectures here on Central Campus. He was a great man, but they saw it as just normal behavior for a decent human being. So enjoy the built environment, guys. Enjoy your community. Grab some time in nature. See as much of the world as you can. We're so lucky to live in the age of air travel and open borders. I'm so happy and lucky to have visited 80 countries in 55 years. We buy annual carbon offsets. 
to compensate for the energy expended, I recommend you do the same. Because flying to your, flying a full plane from LA to Cairo and back takes as much energy as it took to build the pyramids. So you better be buying offsets if you're flying. And live well. We have a 99 walk score downtown. What are you laughing at, Keith? Oh. You know what walk score is? We have the highest, our neighborhood has the highest walk score between New York and Chicago and a very high bike score and transit score. That, you should do your bike score. I have my students do it. Uh, at the end of the term, it's a measure of, you know, how sustainable your, your location is. And we are very lucky to live in Carytown. I'm serious. There are only four communities, four neighborhoods in the entire United States Whole neighborhoods that have a walk square of 100. Whole neighborhoods are harder to do than an individual place. But there are a number of, I've checked other sites around us that also have a walk score of 99. This is as good as it gets. Listen to the music and don't forget to dance. Laugh a lot. We don't have a chance without humor. Uh, when one is done, I got this quote from Craig Wilkins today who wasn't able to come. When one has done all there is to do, it's time to do something else. Uh, it's been a wonderful two decades here. So here are some uh, passing thoughts. Turn out the goddamn lights. <laughs> I walk around this building when I leave and I turn off dozens of lights that burn all night. It's just and they're in empty spaces. It's unbelievable. It's a huge carbon footprint. It's also costing the dean a lot of money to keep those lights going. Pay a student just to walk around the end of the day and turn off the lights. It would be the most cost-effective thing you could do. Seriously. Um, please replace me with someone who's expert in sustainable architecture and urban planning. We need to take a bigger lead in this global war. Um, unfortunately, my salary, which is quite generous, is actually paid by the provost, but I'm hoping Jonathan can claw it back for, for a number of new positions. Um, which I was able to do with Beckley, my predecessor's salary. I hope that works. And I hope those positions deal with these issues. My wife, Kathleen, and I are happy to commit a gift that Jonathan already met mentioned, like former Dean Robert Fishman has done. And that's just the beginning of that gift. It will be uh, six times bigger, ultimately, if everything goes well. Um, and I'm so happy that Urban Design finally has a scholarship. I was very proud to start that program about, I think it was 20 years ago this month. Cycling with Kat, my wife, has kept me sane. We've been cycling, cycling all over the place. That's Kat up at the top of that silo in Kentucky, which is far too hilly a place to bike. I don't recommend it. Molto grazie. Kathleen, I've had 30 wonderful years with. Casey and Tess, my son and daughter, uh, and to all my U of M colleagues and friends. We are selling our condo, which is worth buying, <laughs> frankly. Uh, and we're off to Seattle in January. We already bought this house. Uh, and I'm determined to f have a convertible <laughs> that I can drive my grandkids around in. I love that little mini. So, Kat, I'll be buying one of those. You're on notice. Um, it's a neat house. It doesn't have anywhere near the war score we have here. I'm telling you, this city is very walkable. So, anyone interested in food and drink and my new book at a 40% discount might want to come next door, but maybe there are questions. I, any, yeah, thanks. Thanks. <laughs>